Welcome to TEDx Yaba 2020. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Great. So today we're going to be talking to you about the power of community in transforming Africa. And I want to start with the fact that many years ago, my friend sent me a link to join this community. And I can never forget. I remember where I was, what I was doing. And I clicked on that link and I joined this community and there were 1,601 members. So perhaps I was the 1,602nd member, but today you've got 1.7 million women in that community. What motivated you to start Finn? Um, you know, thank you very much for having me. Uh, first and foremost, I am very excited and I'm very honored to be here. Um, first, I have to let you know that you're one of the very first Finsters because I'm pretty sure we hit a thousand within the first week of existence. So it's, it's wonderful that you are one of our sisters and I really am glad to be here and get this opportunity to do this with you. Um, mm -hmm. Secondly, you see, I know that people often want to know a single moment when something happened. Is there a particular moment? when this became a thing, here's what I'm going to tell you. The journey that landed me on film did not begin on the day that I hit Create Group. This is a conversation that I often have with friends and, and family and the press. Anyone who asks me is that I have lived my entire life and it has led up to this moment. From a very early age, I had a personal awakening. This is not something that often happens to children but I was only six years old when I almost got to run, I got run over by a car. I could have died. I got run over by a taxi in Lagos. And from such an early age, I had a clear sense of my own mortality. That does something to you. And when I was 11 was when it really hit me that I'm a girl and that the expectations that were placed upon me were different from what my brother had to endure and from what my brother had to experience and what expectations were placed upon me uh, were not quite you know, on an equal plane. Uh, it was different than what my brother had to contend with. And one day, well, I, so I basically lived my entire life um, trying to understand why my experiences were different because I'm a girl. Why were those expectations had of me because I was a girl? And it led me to a place where I spent all of my life, and my background is in journalism. So I spent all of my life asking myself a question about how, in what ways can I advance women? In what ways can I advance our voices? Look, as early as age three, I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, very modest means. Um, and as early as age three, whenever a girl you know, shows any sign of outward self-awareness, we are usually told to shut up. We're usually encouraged not to tell our stories. We're encouraged to be silent and let the older people talk and let the smarter people talk and let the men talk. And this does something to you. Do you know, this is our reality. And yet I didn't know what to do with the understanding that I had, with the awareness that I had gathered mm -hmm. since I was a child. And then in 2014, something extraordinary ha uh, happened. I was actually here in the States, uh, sitting in the living room with my husband. When it flashed across CNN that uh, armed men had stormed a school in Northern Nigeria. Sis, the, this is, I'm referring to the Chibo girl, which we all know about the Chibo girls. And that day was when the answer just emerged for me. Mm. I knew that I could not wait any longer. I knew that I could not make any more excuses. And I decided to create a community, a space where I could find women who were like me and we could all mm. come together and do something significant. The goal was to find our voices and create spaces to mm. make that happen. So that was, that was how Finn came to be. I guess you could say that it was a personal awakening that led to you know, my being prepared for Finn. And then I guess you could say the Chibo girls were directly responsible for the inspiration that led to the creation of our Facebook group. 
Fantastic. Amazing, amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. So one of the things about our culture is we grew up, especially in the African culture, to be secretive, right? Um, and to keep things to ourselves, especially if it were private issues, right? And this actually is contrary to being part of community because when you're part of community, you, you're, I mean, you're encouraged to share, you're encouraged to be open, to connect, right? What do you think the role of community is in dispelling traditional norms and culture? Uh, the truth of the matter is not every aspect of our norms and culture are having negative impacts on us. And this is the truth of the matter is that several, probably even majority of our, you know, our cultures are, are good for us. They make us feel a strong sense of belonging. But unfortunately, something has happened is that we don't always focus on you know, the parts of our culture that isn't working for large swaths of our community and large swaths of our society. And unfortunately, that is not fair. I just, you know, painted a picture for you of when you are very young, you know, uh, as early as age three, and whenever girls have something to say, there's often someone who tells you that what you have to say is not something anybody wants to hear. This has a deep impact on our lives. We grow up constantly second guessing ourselves. We grow up not believing that anybody wants to see you, anybody wants to hear you, or what you say doesn't matter. And unfortunately, this goes on to define who we become as adults. This is not right. This is not okay. What is the, the worst, the worst of it is that women grow up on feeling like we have to take on the burden of domestic violence, sexual mm. assault. We shut up. We were trained with pain to shut up. Um, you know, you know, how, I mean, you're a woman. You know how it works generally, that whenever you say something out of turn, usually a woman, an aunt or someone will come close to you, put two fingers together, put mm -hmm. it, stick it to your side and twist and tell you in no, you know, on short terms that you should not be speaking up when other people are speaking. So we start to endure pain and we start to endure all forms of systemic abuse, even as we grow up, even when we become independent. This is not okay. We started to realize that that was having really deep and torturous you know, impacts on us when things started and women had trouble coming up to say that this is happening to them in their houses from financial strife from domestic violence and all forms of you know, problematic behaviors that we were being subjected to in our personal lives. But the good news is our community is showing that when we speak up, when we speak up, something incredible happens. We realize that we're not alone. This is one of the biggest ways in which we have been using community to dispel the cultural norms that are not serving us. We're seeing you know, that a sense of community and a sense of belonging helps people feel more comfortable. But then you have to remember, it's important to set up the right atmosphere. It's important to set up the right conditions mm -hmm. for people to feel comfortable enough to tell their stories. And that is exactly what I and my team do every single day. We build communities that are based on trust. And when the trust is irrefutable, when the trust is strong, people feel comfortable telling our stories. We are able to break the norms that are not working for us because we have created the conditions that make that possible. So, you know, that, I guess that that is the most powerful ways we are showing up through uh, communication, through uh, making sure that we provide a sense of belonging, uh, through ensuring that we take very seriously the trust that our community members are giving us and standing up to fight for them whenever we need to. So I think that, you know, that is, I think community is really the best way to, um, uh, to go about creating the kind of sense of belonging that would make people feel like uh, they, are, they matter. That would, and it's dis, dis, helping to dispel, it's helping to dispel the cultures that don't work for us overall. 
Great, and that takes me to my next question. So how do you think community building can unite and transform Africa? I don't only think community building can unite and transform Africa. I think community building might be our saving grace. When I started our group, everybody told me that it didn't make sense, that it wouldn't work, that women would never share our stories because they are aware of our roots. They know that with pain, we have been taught to not tell our stories and come out. But here's what has happened. I realized that they were wrong. They were wrong. When we, you know, when we move away from conventional wisdom, we start to see what is possible. And that is what I've realized with our community is that everything that we've been told could not happen is happening. And therefore, I think that bringing people, you know, I mean, like what is community in the first place? What is community building? Community building is essentially people coming together, a community is people coming together with a shared purpose. And they have a, you know, they have a, a string of, you know, a shared sense of significance, a shared sense of belonging running through all of them towards a purpose. The purpose of my community is to end the culture of silence. We're very clear on what that is, which means imagine a world where we can build communities on every issue. If you're interested in something, you know, whether you want to, you know, you want to help people who are struggling with a specific kind of disease, um, or you want to change something you don't like about society. In today's age, it's as simple. It's as simple as going onto the internet and creating a, a space and then doing the work to make that space habitable for people. The truth of the matter is, when you are able to come together as a people in massive numbers mm -hmm. to walk towards the same goal, that is when the real magic happens. Mm -hmm. That is what we need more than anything else. Look at all the walls that are between us. We're struggling with ethnic differences. We're struggling with faith differences. We're struggling with socioeconomic differences. All of those things have now melted under the power of our shared purpose. This mm. is what is possible. That women, think about it, that women from all over the world, more than 100 countries can come together from all over the world, come together and be living in harmony and be building compassion together and be working with each other to be kind, to be, you know, taking care of each other and to be self-policing themselves and to be self-assessing their own behaviors all by themselves. Do you really, I mean, on our group, for instance, more, about 10 women, only 10 women are leading a nation of 1.7 million people. Do you understand the amount of self, uh, you know, self-awareness that must go on in a space like that, where everybody in the community is coming together and working together with a shared purpose to provide a comfortable environment for so many women, a massive amount of women? This is what is possible in our regular lives away from our community. And I think quite frankly that every, everywhere we are in, in education, in academia, or any other aspect of our lives, our daily life, we need to build community building into it. We already have that, if I'm being honest. Uh, from a very young age, we have the village gatherings, the village meetings, even in our, in our families, our families are a community, um, and even our ba faith-based environments, our churches, our mosques, these are communities. So this isn't, this isn't new. But what social media has provided is an opportunity for us to scale the communities that we've always had and make something extraordinary out of it. And we have the communication tools now to be able to broadcast positive, kind, and compassionate ideas to a giant amount of people. At the same time, I think every organization should build communities. I think every you know, entity should build communities. I think even businesses, you can build a community around your product. You can build a community around your brand. You can build a community around whatever cause that matters to you. Communities isn't something that should be a tool for achieving what we're trying to achieve. Community should be the tool for bringing us together, helping us find union, breaking the walls that are keeping us apart. Community isn't just an idea that, you know, 
we might need and that may be able to make a difference for us. Community is what we need that will be able to transform our lives and we can have everybody carried along at the same time. Fantastic. So can you share with us some of the challenges that you have faced in building? Obviously, I'm sure that there have been challenges. You've talked about the power of community. But what are some of the challenges that you've faced building a community with 1.7 million members? <laughs> so many challenges, sis. Uh, you see, what I learned very quickly, because it is one thing to have a wonderful idea. And it is another thing to have the ability and the skill to actually communicate that idea so well that people understand your idea and they are willing to join you and work with you to advance that idea. But it is quite another for you to try to sell an idea that does not or something that has never existed. So the biggest challenge that we had was pushback. I learned very, very quickly that the truth of the matter is when we don't understand something and it is new, people are going to fight you. They are going to fight you. Um, okay, so here is, let me set the stage for you. When we just started our group, people realized that something was going on here. What is this place that women are going to and they are sharing their stories? We are out here defying a culture of silence that we are all used to. We've been doing this. When something is wrong, you don't talk. People tell you that is airing dirty laundry, right? And so they fight you when you talk. There are societal structures that have been created to stop us from sharing our stories. And then suddenly, there's this lady who is, you know, this Niger girl who is saying that she wants to reverse something that we've all believed and conventional wisdom has told us that that is the only way to live for a really long time. What do you think is going to happen to me? There's going to be deep pushback. If you're watching me today, and if you have a goal, or you have a cause, and there's something that fires up your heart that you want to do, understand that there will be pushback if it is something innovative, it's something that has never existed. But we cannot let that stop us. I think that that may have been the most significant uh, thing, a uh, challenge that we had earlier on. But the good news is this, even, you know, pushback, depending on, you know, where you're coming from and who you are and what your goal is, what is your why, then if you have the right why, you understand that pushback is not a bad thing. Pushback is just a sign that what you're doing is right. It is validation that what you're doing is creating impact. It is validation that what you're doing is changing the status quo that is not serving you. And so at the end of the day, that is what it came down to. We got a lot of pushback and we did the work to ensure that people understand. We didn't ignore the pushback. We did the work of communicating the goals and the mission of the community. We were clear on it. We got better at refining it as we, as we went along and suddenly, and after enough time, uh, people started to see the impact of what we were doing. It's irrefutable. You cannot miss it. They started to understand the value of our community. And instead of just pushing back, they are now joining up with me. Just extraordinary women from more than 100 countries. People who used to push back are now on board. They are now working with us to advance the extraordinary idea of bringing women together and creating stronger relationships. The second one, the second major challenge is leadership. I have to be honest with you. When I just started our group, I don't, I, I mean, to a large extent, I had the skill of communication, but I struggled with one thing, the realization that I now have a new role that I've never really seen myself as having before. Leadership, leadership understanding and being able to acknowledge that, hey girl, you are now a leader. People look up to you. People expect you to take responsibility. People trust you. People believe in the words that are coming out of your mouth, which comes with the responsibility. So it took me a minute. It took me a minute to step into that role and say, I'm a leader now. Accepting that reality means taking the responsibility, you know, committing to taking responsibility. And that was, you know, that I think that for anyone out there, if you are in, you're thinking about running a community or leading a community around any idea or any ideal, 
it's very, very vital that you understand that you are a leader. To say I am a leader is not, you know, bragging or, you know, that's the way we were raised to believe. But this is being proud to say you're a leader or being, you know, it's, it's like be, thinking that you're all that. That is not it. Taking, being, saying that I am a leader is saying that I am ready to step into the role of taking responsibility and committing myself to making the best of what I have created. So that those were the two major challenges um, that we have, I, I'm very happy to say, that we have largely worked through um, since the advent of our community. Amazing, and my final question. So what is next for Finn and for Lola Omolola? There is several different things that we are absolutely working on, but what I will tell you is this, Finn, is not a trend. Finn is a way of life. It is women, you know, understanding that in order for us to create a, co a community, in order for us to create a world that is healthier, that is safer for us, that we all have to do the work together. It is not just one person with the passion to make a difference. It is all of us working together and assessing the, you know, the power of collective responsibility and assessing the power of collective heart and spirit is what it takes to you know, move our community forward. So Finn is an institution that does not change by itself. It's, you know, our community is led by three major um, pillars. Number one is to build compassion. Number two, um, we call that Finn love, by the way, Number two is to nurture the power of self-expression. We call that fin spirit. And number three is to, well, number two is to encourage peer-to-peer -peer support. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run that over again. The number one is to basically build compassion because empathy is not really <laughs> a cultural strong suit for us. Number two is encouraging peer-to-peer -peer support. We have to help the people around us. We have to lift other people up, not just women, but also men and the people we work with in our daily lives, everybody our lives touch. So we call that fin spirit. And the third is you know, to nurture the power of self-expression. We call that fin call to ensure that every woman who has a story has a space to speak it, to, you know, to tell her story. So that is the goal of our community, to continue to do that regardless of whether it's in five years, whether it's in 10 years, whether it's in 20 years, we want to be able to continue to do that. Now, there are other things that we can do at the same time. Um, this, is, this is something that I'm very passionate about. I want to take the heart and the tone of our community to women who don't have access to the internet. Having access to the internet and data is a privilege that isn't afforded to everybody. I mean, this is just to the truth. And therefore, we want to be able to put those women, place those women in the fold too. We don't want Finstars only to be the women who can afford to use the community. We want it to be every woman, regardless of where she is. And we're working on multimedia solutions that can allow us to use platforms that can allow us to uh, meet those women where they are located as well. And the second uh, angle, the second plan that we're working on right now is teaching. I feel a strong sense of responsibility to take everything that I have learned to show and share it with everybody else. Number one, I think community building and it should be in the curriculum of the, every university across the world. And this includes Lagos in Nigeria, the rest of Africa. I think that we should teach young people how to bring people together responsibly, how to lead responsibly. And I am doing the work and I've learned the lessons and I understand the strategies to make that happen. And I want to be able to help organizations build out communities around what is important to them so that we don't only you know, go about doing these things haphazardly so that we can actually create real change, create extraordinary social impact and change our circumstances for good. And so those are the two major things that we're working on doing right now. Taking uh, rural areas into, into consideration and teaching, teaching. Uh, we just created a, a new sub-community called Finn Champions. Finn Champions is where we're teaching and talking to women 
every single day, sharing ideas and strategies on how to live our daily lives. So that is what it comes down to, imparting giving access to, to our community, to women who don't have internet access, and, and giving um, the gift of education and helping people understand the value of bringing people together. That's, that's, that's the goal. Lala Omalala, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It has been the founder of FIN, a 1.7 million member community, sharing with us the power of community building to transform Africa. Thank you very much, Lola.